Hi, and welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy, where today we will conclude our series on the age of Jackson with a look at his presidency and beyond. In our previous videos, we saw how the rise of Jackson and the movement behind his popularity, fueled in part by the corrupt bargain between Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams to keep Jackson out of the White House, had divided a once one-party state during the era of good feelings. We examined what is referred to as Jacksonian democracy in which we saw a movement away from rule by the elite aristocracy towards something more resembling rule by the people. Known as the people's president, Jackson came to symbolize this transfer of power and rose as a spokesman for the common man who felt left out of the political process. Jacksonian democracy coincided with the expansion of voting access for more Americans as states began to get rid of property requirements to vote, and political participation in elections grew rapidly. We saw a split in the Democratic-Republican Party, those favoring Jackson calling themselves just Democrats, and those who favored a more active central government like Henry Clay calling themselves National Democrats. This split seemed to run along geographic lines as northern manufacturers and tradesmen favoring the National Democrats and southern and western farmers going for Jacksonian Democrats. So what do you need to know? Again, we are going to look at Jackson's presidency, the battles he took on with the other branches of government like the Supreme Court and the institutions like the National Bank, how he created what is known as the spoils system, and his policy of Indian removal. And just a reminder, teachers, that this PowerPoint with a variety of resources are available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just click the link in the notes below this video or search for Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy at Teacher Pay Teachers. So again, our themes for today are Indian removal, Jackson's battle over the National Bank, his implementation of the spoils system, and his battles with the other branches. In 1828, President Jackson won in a landslide election known as the People's President. He was expected to expand access to the government to the quote-unquote common man. Many complained of too much bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is a word in which non-elected officials run the government. And people still complain about this. Almost immediately after taking office, Jackson fired most federal employees and replaced them with his supporters. This practice became known as the quote-unquote spoils system from the expression, quote, to the victor belong the spoils. Unfortunately, this tradition in which family members, financial supporters, friends, and fellow party members are provided with federal jobs persisted for a long time and still does to a certain extent. However, it was legally outlawed by the Pendleton Act in 1883. Many complained that by appointing officials based on what we call patronage rather than merit, Jackson was acting like a tyrant. Of course, those who received those jobs loved Jackson for it. Jackson's supporters also got rid of the unpopular caucus system in which meetings of party leaders chose the party's candidates. Parties began allowing a more open system of selecting the candidates known as nominating conventions, which is a gathering of delegates from the states. This is how parties have chosen their candidates ever since, kind of. However, Jackson's popularity would not go unchecked. Prior to Jackson's presidency, the other branches had flexed their powers as well. As Jackson knew from the election of 1824, Henry Clay and the Congress was a force to be reckoned with and he would have to rely on their support. Meanwhile, the judicial branch had been slowly gaining power in decisions ever since. They were somewhat neglected in the Constitution, but in 1803, a case called Marbury v. Madison, the judicial branch under the newly appointed Chief Justice John Marshall had established what's called judicial review. Judicial review is the power to declare laws and executive orders unconstitutional. In other rulings, such as McCullough versus Maryland, in which they ruled that states could not tax the Bank of the United States, or Gibbons versus Ogden, which outlawed monopolies, the court expanded the power of the federal government and the judicial branch. Finally, the court ruled that the second Bank of the United States was constitutional, 
setting the stage for a showdown with future President Andrew Jackson and those like him who felt that the bank was unconstitutional. In 1828, Congress passed a high tariff on imported goods, and we've talked about the effects of tariffs or taxes on imports in previous lessons. Southerners who backed Jackson feared a retaliation on the exports of their cotton and other farm goods to Europe and beyond. Jackson's vice president, John C. Calhoun, from South Carolina, claimed that states had the right to, quote-unquote, nullify this federal law. At a dinner party in 1830, celebrating Thomas Jefferson's birthday, Jackson offered a toast aimed at Calhoun, saying, quote-unquote, our union, it must be preserved. To which Vice President John C. Calhoun responded, quote, The Union, next to our liberty, most dear, it can only be preserved by respecting the rights of the states. This interchange demonstrated the split between those favoring a strong central government and those who were for states' rights, one that still exists today. In 1832, South Carolina passed the Nullification Act and even threatened to secede from the Union. Jackson persuaded Congress to pass the Force Bill, authorizing him to use military force to execute federal law. South Carolina eventually backed down when a lower tariff was passed in 1832. And some say by this demonstration of strength by Jackson, a man known not to back down from a fight. With the nullification crisis settled, the nation and Jackson turned their attention to Native Americans. As America was expanding westward, they were running into native tribes who seemed to be in their way. There were five quote-unquote civilized tribes, the Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Choctaw tribes, living in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida, that had taken on farming and quote-unquote American lifestyles. However, land-hungry white settlers and Jackson pressured Congress to pass the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Congress established what they called the Indian Territory in what is most of present-day Oklahoma. Many tribes were pressured to sign treaties and move west, but one tribe, the Cherokee, refused. To stop their removal, the Cherokee turned to the Supreme Court of Chief Justice John Marshall, who ruled in favor of the Cherokees, saying it was unfair for Georgia to kick them out. Andrew Jackson supposedly responded, quote, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. In 1835, a few Cherokees signed a treaty agreeing to move west, but most of the tribe claimed that the signers did not speak for them. They appealed to Congress, where senators such as Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, as well as many Americans, opposed what they called this fake treaty. In 1838, Jackson's successor, President Martin Van Buren, ordered 15,000 Cherokee under military guard to be forcibly marched west to the Indian Territory. 4,000 Cherokee died along the journey of disease, hunger, and exposure to the weather. Their journey has become called the Trail of Tears, an ugly stain on American history. Jackson's final battle was fought against the Second Bank of the United States. He, like many Americans, thought it was unconstitutional and a symbol of big government and northern financial interest. With the election of 1832 underway, Clay and Webster, both supporters of the bank, voted to renew its charter, thinking a Jackson veto would hurt him with the voters. Jackson did veto the bill, but despite an expected backlash, the people supported his decision and re-elected him. He removed the government's money from the bank and spread it out to smaller state banks labeled pet banks, eventually leading to the death of the National Bank in 1836. However, in hindsight, (laughs) Jackson's decision to destroy the bank might not have been the best call. A year after he stepped down from the presidency, the country suffered a huge economic downturn, or depression. Jackson's successor, President Martin Van Buren, a believer in the principle of laissez-faire, or non-governmental interference, did little to ease the suffering. This became known as the Panic of 1837. The Panic of 1837 led to the ouster of Van Buren after only one term and the creation of the Whig Party. 
The Whigs favored more government aid to the economy, such as the development of internal improvements like national roads and canals. In their second presidential election as a party, their candidate, William Henry Harrison, you might remember him, the hero of Tippecanoe, Tippecanoe and Tyler too, won the election. However, dying only 32 days into his presidency and seceded by his vice president, John Tyler, a former Democrat, the Whigs would struggle to see their plan implemented. For now, anyway. So what is the legacy of Andrew Jackson? Well, the presidency of Andrew Jackson is seen as a pivotal turning point in American history. As we've stated, Jackson has come to symbolize the expansion of political participation in America. He's also known for greatly expanding the power of the presidency. While many of his quote-unquote accomplishments are seen as controversial, his age, the Jackson age, would forever change the presidency and presidential elections. And despite Tyler's attempts to stop internal improvements, the country was on the verge of massive growth and westward expansion. And that's where we will pick up next time with what we call Manifest Destiny. But before we do, let's review. Jackson instituted a policy of giving federal jobs to supporters and friends known as the Spoils System. Jackson's supporters got rid of party caucuses and implemented this event to choose candidates. The nominating conventions. This case gave the U.S. Supreme Court the power to declare laws unconstitutional. Marbury v. Madison. These two cases further strengthened the power of the national government and the Supreme Court. That would be McCulloch v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden. What federal law did John C. Calhoun say could be ignored by his state? The Tariff of 1828, also known as the Tariff of Abominations. What is this idea of a state ignoring or failing to enforce national laws called? Nullification. The Cherokee, Choctaw, Seminole, Creek, and Chickasaw Indian tribes were known as the Five Civilized Tribes. What Supreme Court case ruled in favor of the Cherokees? Worcester versus Georgia. What did Jackson say in response to this ruling? Quote, Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. When President Van Buren rounded up the Cherokees and marched them west to the Indian Territory, it was known as the Trail of Tears. What institution did Jackson battle saying that it was unconstitutional? The National Bank. What resulted from the death of the National Bank? The Panic of 1837. What party was created to challenge Jacksonian Democrats? The Whigs. And that's it. I want to thank you guys for watching. Be sure to subscribe because up next we will be looking at Manifest Destiny, the great movement westward. And just a reminder, teachers, that this PowerPoint with worksheets, quizzes, cahoots, guided notes, lesson plans, and additional activities are available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just click the link in the notes below this video. Search for Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy at Teachers Pay Teachers. Again, guys, thanks for watching. Keep up that good work and, and you're going to ace that next exam.